Okay. First up, just a brief uh, info slide with the link to the seminar series webpage uh, and how to sign up for uh, updates about future seminars. There's an email address at the bottom of this screen. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to today's Sophie seminar. I'm Andrew Patton, the organizer of the series. And today I'm very happy to be hosting Seth Pruitt from Arizona State University as our speaker. Our discussant, his discussant will be Jenny Bai from Georgetown University. We'll follow the usual format of 40 minutes for the speaker, 10 minutes for the discussion, and 10 minutes for Q&A uh, at the end. If you have questions during the seminar, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or you can just use the raise your hand button and I'll call on you to ask your question of Seth directly. Uh, and I think that's it with everything on the admin side. So Seth, over to you. How about I unmute myself and That'd not be perfect. act like a complete rookie? Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Brian Kelly and Diogo Paul Harris. And we're going to be looking at the corporate bond market, which is comparably sized to uh, the stock market currently. But I'd say that we'd say that the literature here is a, a little bit less developed than what we've seen on the equity side. And so in large part, we're going to try to contribute and uh, fill a little bit of a gap there. So the equation that we'll have in mind to organize our thinking here is a conditional linear factor model, the kind that I've written down on the screen where the excess return on corporate bond I at time T plus one is related to possibly an alpha for that bond at that time, okay? That would be some part of the return, the excess return that you can predict that is not about exposure to aggregate risk. What else can be driving that return? Well, it could also be the exposure to aggregate risk. These factors, FT plus one, that are realized that time and then some idiosyncratic return. And a large part of asset pricing empirically revolves around whether or not these alphas are zero as they should be in a no arbitrage model. And so basically the simple question we're gonna ask is how well does a conditional factor model explain corporate bond returns? Does no arbitrage appear to hold? Now, in order to make progress here, we're gonna follow a previous paper that Brian and I have with our co-author Yunan, where we use something called instrument and principal components to answer this question. And so in that JFE paper, we find that this method has novel success in explaining simultaneously the risk that are there in stock returns, the compensation that stocks receive, and therefore the mean bear and sufficient frontier that's operational in stocks. So we're going to apply this method to corporate bonds. And in a way it's like an out of sample test of that method here in corporate bonds, a very important market as we just saw on the previous slide. And the bottom line is that we'll be able to explain around 32% out of sample of the variation of corporate bond returns on the basis of aggregate risks that we identify. We'll find that, ooh, I'm sorry, I have the wrong slides here. My bad, I'm sorry about that. It looked different right away, I knew it. Sorry. Technical glitches happen in various forms. This is no problem. I appreciate that. That's a kind thing to say. Uh, and it's just good for laughs, really. And, and that's really nice. <laughs> Let me share this, these slides instead. Okay. So these slides we'll see that the compensation that we're estimating, the expected returns, both conditional and unconditional that we estimate are very accurate. And I'll give metrics numbers for that statement later on. And because of that, what we'll find is that the mean variance efficient frontier that we estimate here is incredibly profitable. We will find that that frontier, that systematic strategies on that frontier, think the tangency portfolio of these aggregate risks we identify as an out of sample annualized sharp ratio of 3.9. These are substantial improvements from literature benchmarks that I will talk about. So those are the big bottom lines. Now, some additional takeaways in this paper are that 
the four factors that will kind of as a benchmark arrive at can be thought of as a duration kind of factor, a value factor, a market factor that has a volatility tilt and a momentum factor that has kind of an investment grade tilt. And so in that way, they resemble in some way the uh, four factors that my co-author Diogo Paul Harris and Israel and Richardson put in a, a journal not too long ago. What we also find is that the non-systematic portfolios that we estimate are very profitable, okay? So what do I mean by this? We are trying our best to explain expected returns as really just exposures to systematic risks. We do the best that we can with that. And then we ask, is there what we call a pure alpha portfolio that is orthogonal to systematic risks that's profitable? And we find it's very profitable. Now, two interesting points about this. One, that contrasts what we found in stocks. We found that non-systematic strategies were not nearly as profitable as systematic strategies, okay? That would say that the evidence for no arbitrage in stocks was relatively strong. In corporate bonds, no. So that's a difference. Furthermore, what we find is that equity momentum is a characteristic that is important not only for systematic exposure, but for this non-systematic pure alpha portfolio. So that again contrasts with what you see in stocks. Brian and I have a paper forthcoming with Toby Moskowitz that makes this clear, that momentum in equity momentum in stock returns essentially is a crude measure of the time varying exposures to aggregate risks. Once you control for those aggregate risks, momentum signal is basically subsumed. That is not what we find in corporate bonds. And so I think that that is another interesting takeaway at the end of the day. Now, how does the core idea work? We're going to instrument exposures, okay? So the beta for every corporate bond I at time T is a linear function Okay, so that gamma beta is just a parameter matrix. It's a linear function of L characteristics you see at time t, observable data. We will have L be moderately sized. It'll be 47 in our application. And we're going to dimension reduce what the characteristics are telling us about aggregate risks to say that they're telling us about four or five aggregate risk factors. At the end of the day, that's where we'll arrive. In general, you could estimate any number of factors, but of course, for this kind of academic idea of wanting to be as parsimonious as possible, we'd like K, the number of factors, to be smaller than the number of characteristics. The important thing in this model is that the gamma beta is constant over time and across bonds. So that's telling us that the only way that a bond's exposure to risk changes, either in the cross section or over time, is if its observable characteristics change. And once you know from say another set of bonds, say you estimate this parameter matrix on a set of bonds, once you know how those bonds exposures vary, you could port over this gamma beta matrix to some other uh, set of bonds, some other asset class even, and know how their systematic exposures should move. Everything is moving in this model as a function of data. Therefore, the end result is we're going to estimate far fewer parameters than typically is done. Now, when we estimate both this gamma matrix, the parameters, and the factors themselves, this is the full-blown instrumented principal components method. What we could also do is just take our measurement of aggregate risk as given, bring in what we call observable factors say that the Israel, Paul Harris and Richardson factors. We could pour over the pharma French equity factors. We could take the state of the art corporate bond factors from Jenny and co-authors paper by Bali and Nguyen. And we could instrument those factors exposures with the observable characteristics. And an interesting takeaway that I'll show you is that instrumenting even observable factor exposures can lead to superior performance. So that's gonna be another takeaway as well. So what data do we use? We use 29 bond slash firm characteristics. Some are bond specific like duration, some are firm specific like the leverage ratio for a firm and 17 industry dummies. So in total with a constant, we'll have 47 characteristics. We'll focus on the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch universe. Um, we'll be using pricing data from IDC which is a data vendor that many large asset managers use. It's a combination of trace data 
dealer quotes and manual adjustment. It is, we would argue, the best pricing data that one can get. I would say at this current time, we're working on robustness checks that use only the publicly available data and trace from the words uh, data repository, and we see very similar uh, qualitative results. We institute a five-day shift in the returns that we're using to be conservative. This is what I mean. Usually monthly returns are what you experience between the end of the trading day of the last trading day of a month and the end of the trading day of the next month. What we're going to do is shift that ahead by five trading days, okay? So instead of the April return being about what was experienced between the first trading day of April and the last trading day of April, it will be what you receive between the fifth trading day of April and the fifth trading day of May. The reason why we do that is to be conservative because corporate bonds are less liquidly traded. In essence, what we're saying is that we're giving the investor in this model about five days to put on their trades. All our results are much stronger, or not much stronger, they are stronger if we don't institute this shift. So we see this as a conservative approach to dealing with corporate bonds, uh, lesser liquidity than equities. We perform an ex ante volatility adjustment for these bond positions uh, using duration time spread. So think of duration time spread. This is something you know ahead of time. And it roughly acts as a volatility adjustment for these bonds. What happens is that time series volatility for bonds, so think about every bond's time series volatility. Cross-sectionally, it's actually much more heterogeneous, more spread out than the cross-section of stock time series volatilities. So this volatility adjustment is a way to kind of homogenize this. I'll also say that in robustness results, we also are pursuing results using just unadjusted returns. Um, and we see again, qualitatively similar stories. At the end of the day, we're going to have about 14,000 unique bonds in this data, about half a million bond month observations. That's the fundamental unit of observation over about 22 years. So let's do some preliminary analysis. I'm going to consider the characteristics, not the sectoral dynamics. I'm going to ask just at the beginning, do they tell us anything about expected returns? So how I'm going to do that is I'm going to just for each characteristic on its own, use it to sort a portfolio. I'm going to ask, does it sort a portfolio that receives significant profits? And what you see, so what I'm reporting here are annualized sharp ratios. And what you see is that out of sample, many of these do tell us something about differences in expected returns. Unsurprising, we took these from the literature. Previous papers have made this connection before. We're just verifying that this is true in our data. Many of these characteristics are meaningfully, statistically significantly related to differences in expected returns. Now, in fact, one of these characteristics, equity momentum, defines the most profitable corporate bond strategy. Just sorting bonds by the equity momentum of the firm yields an out of sample annualized sharp ratio of 1.9. So many of these are related to expected returns on a preliminary analysis. Now, the asset pricing question is, are, is this expected return information related to aggregate exposure? So a kind of simple way of getting at that would be to do what Toby and Brian and I do in stocks. We'd ask, okay, does this characteristic predict future covariance with aggregate risk? From an ICAPM kind of standpoint, that's why some characteristics should tell you about expected returns. It tells you about future covariance. So we look for evidence of this. Just to start with, we basically look for aggregate exposures to just an, a bond market factor. Okay, so think of this as a bond market cap in. I'm going to estimate for every bond and every time a realized beta, I call real beta here, on the market, the bond market factor. And I'm going to do that by regressing the bonds returns in the future on that aggregate factors realizations in the future over the next year. And I'm going to ask, does the characteristic at time t meaningfully predict that aggregate beta, the covariance in the future. So that realized beta is gonna have measurement error, but it's gonna be classical. 
Okay, so these are going to be unbiased real data estimates at each point in time. It's just going to affect our standard errors and statistical precision. And what we see is that many of the profitable characteristics, okay, many of the characteristics that on their own were telling us about expected returns are also telling us about future covariance with this bond market risk. Okay, so preliminary evidence that maybe some of these characteristics are telling us about expected returns in a no arbitrage way. They're telling us about expected returns because they tell us about future covariance. But some of these characteristics do not. Some of these were profitable when I used them to sort portfolios. But look at equity momentum. That was the most profitable portfolio. If I used the equity momentum of a firm to sort corporate bonds, it gave me a sharp ratio of 1.9. Equity momentum tells me literally nothing. That's the point estimate. Literally nothing about future covariance. So on a preliminary basis, this looks like profits without aggregate risk. But this is just a preliminary analysis, okay? The limitations with this, well, first and foremost, maybe that bond market factor doesn't totally capture aggregate risk. We're familiar with that. We don't think that the cap M captures everything we need to know about aggregate risk. Furthermore, I'd say that there's a little bit of an ad hoc connection between the results. I'm gonna use this as a motivation for estimating this full-blown conditional model that I'm going into and using this new technology to do it. I'm going to judge whether this model and other models performs well by a variety of metrics. The first is the total R squared. So this is going to be the proportion of variation in bond excess returns that's coming from the fitted model that the factors explain. So how well does this model describe realized return variation, that is aggregate risk, one. Two, the first of my two compensation type metrics, a predictive R squared. How much of the variation in excess returns is coming is explained by the conditional expectations that the model estimates. Okay, which I have is beta t minus one, that time varying exposure times the risk price, which is just the expectation of the factors because these are tradable factors. Okay, so how well does the model explain conditional compensation? Then we also look at something we call the pricing error R squared. So this is more towards how well is the model doing it explaining unconditional compensation? Okay, so think of all of these bonds, there are 14,000 of them, right? Think of their average returns. How well do the conditional expected returns that we estimated here, how well do they explain at the end of the day, the cross section of unconditional expected returns? They explain all of the average returns for every bond, that'd be a pricing error R squared of 100%. If they explain none, that'd be zero. Okay, so this is kind of like a normalization of what the GRS uh, test statistic would look like. And then, Probably a core question here would be, how efficient is the mean variance efficient frontier that's coming out the other end of this model? Okay, so we're, I'm gonna measure mean variance efficiency in two ways. One, these conditional expected returns I can use to form a spread, a quintile spread portfolio, go long the high expected return bonds, go, low, go short the low expected return. This is a spread systematic strategy. It takes no stand on the covariance structure within the factor space. I'm gonna report that. What I'll also do is form an XNT tangency portfolio. I will have past realizations of what I've estimated the factors to be. I can estimate their covariance matrix on that basis and therefore construct and their means and construct a tangency portfolio. These will be the two systematic strategies we consider, which are trying to attack and address the question how much, uh, how efficient is the mean variance efficient frontier that we're estimating here. Finally, I think that some interesting statistical tests come out of this. One, we could generalize the model as I have here with an alpha. It's a time varying alpha. It's just a direct function of the characteristics because the characteristics are realized at time T minus one. This is a predictable part of returns that is not related to exposure to aggregate risks. So what I can test is if this gamma alpha vector is all zero. Because if so, the only way that the characteristics tell me anything 
is via betas, via exposure to systematic risk. So that'll be one interesting test that I talk about. Also, we might be interested in whether or not a certain characteristic when considered with all the others is statistically significant. Is it giving you significant information on its own when jointly considered? That would be tantamount to asking the question, are all the elements in a row of this gamma beta zero? Because if all the elements are zero in that row, then the characteristic associated with that row is not changing the beta at all. Okay, and that will be the other test that we'll see. Let me just cut to a bottom line. These are compare, this is comparative performance across a number of models. I'm gonna go slow. This is out of sample performance. And on the rightmost column is our benchmark model. It is a four factor model that restricts gamma alpha to be zero. That is, it restricts all the characteristic information to flow only through betas. And on the next slide, I'll motivate why this is the benchmark model. But as you can see, it's out of pre sample performance is quite good. Here are the numbers to back that up. It explains about 32% of the variation in corporate bond returns out of sample, okay? In stocks, what we found is that the, the factors we estimated only explain maybe in the 20, 20%. So there's more explanation of corporate bond returns from systematic sources here. We also, in the course of this procedure, I'm kind of glossing over it, we form managed portfolios, okay? So think of those portfolios that were univariate sorts based on the characteristics. Um, that's part of this procedure. And it turns out that the same factors and model estimates that explain 32% of the individual bond returns explain about 96% of the variation in those 47 portfolios, okay? That's the managed portfolios. Now, how much of this variation is predictable? out of sample about 1.2%. That's about double what we saw in stocks. So it seems like there's more predictability in these corporate bond returns. What's the pricing error? Okay, now again, what is the pricing error R squared? The idea here is we want to have some kind of measure of how well we're doing unconditionally for pricing these bonds. Think of all 14,000 bonds as having 14,000 average returns. How well did the model do at explaining the variation in those average returns. We can explain about 65% of the variation in that cross section of the individual bond returns. So consistent with those pieces of evidence, what we see is that the systematic strategies that are based on these factors, the expected returns and the factors coming from this model out of sample yield an unprecedented amount of profitability. So for instance, the tangency portfolio out of sample that we're estimating here has an annualized sharp ratio of 3.9. Now, this is all being achieved while estimating far fewer parameters than other models require. Why is that? The parameters that we need to estimate are in that gamma beta matrix. That's four times 47, about 200 parameters. Otherwise the beta variation over time or cross-sexually comes from data. Those parameters are needed to map the variation in bond characteristics to changes in their beta. But we're not estimating a unique beta for every bond. Now, this parameter count is 1,200 because I think it's also fair to include the latent factor realizations that we're also estimating as basically parameters. If you think about this from like a state space perspective, when you estimate the parameters in the Kalman filter and the factors, I think it's fair to say that the factors and the parameters are both kind of both parameters at the same time. Okay. Now, this contrasts with what you'd have to do with what we call observable factors. Okay. Think using Fama French, think using a market factor. Because there, you would estimate a unique exposure for every bond by running a regression of the bond return on the factor return. So if you have one factor and 14,185 bonds, you're estimating 14,185 parameters. If you have four factors, you're estimating 56,000 parameters and five factors, 70,000. And so this increase, this improved performance as you go across the rows, you can see this increased performance is really coming from a dimension reduction that's very useful. It's using the characteristics 
and their variation cross-sectionally and over time to give us a lot of useful information about how systematic exposures vary cross-sectionally and over time. So this is kind of the bottom line comparative uh, performance. Now this, why a four factor model that constrains alpha to be zero? Because when we estimate, so this is in sample estimation now, when we estimate this IPCA model for different dimensions of the factor space, what we see is that once we allow for four factors, now we allow the characteristics to be telling us information about exposure to four factors. That's how rich the aggregate risk space needs to be. At that point, the total R squareds between the restricted, okay, gamma alpha equals zero, and the unrestricted, let this gamma alpha vector be whatever it wants to be, is not that big. Furthermore, the predictive R squared is barely changed. Consistent with that, when we test the hypothesis that gamma alpha equals zero, we can accept it at the 1% level. That's the p-value, 0.04. Okay, why the likelihood ratio statistic kind of intuition? If uh, imposing that the parameter is zero doesn't really change the fit of your model that much, you accept the hypothesis. That's what's going on here. And that's why our benchmark model has four factors and imposes the no arbitrage restriction that gamma alpha is zero. That means the characteristics only tell us about expected returns because they tell us about systematic risk exposures. What we can also do then now is that in this joint setup where all the characteristics are being allowed to have their say, we can ask, is one particular characteristic significant? And it turns out that many are, most are not. When we test them in this joint structure, okay, an advantage over say like a perform uh, portfolio sort kind of methodology, which in some sense would be like conditional on what you had started with and how you sorted to begin with. Here, all the characteristics are being given an equal say. And interestingly to me, to us, is that equity momentum here is found to be significant. Okay, so remember that preliminary analysis said equity momentum defines a really profitable portfolio. Therefore, it's telling us about expected returns, but it doesn't tell us anything about aggregate covariance. Well, that was wrong. It was wrong because that bond market factor was not the end all be all of what is aggregate risk in the corporate bond market. When we have a better, measure of the systematic risk space, we see that momentum is telling us about exposures to aggregate risks. And therefore, at least part of what it was telling us about expected returns is flowing through thetas. So this is just the wrap up. It's really what I just said, superior performance in this model versus I think state of the art competitors. We find evidence that four factors are appropriate in the corporate bond market because once we get to four factors, we can accept the hypothesis that characteristics only matter through beta. There's no alpha left. And we find that several characteristics drive exposures and equity momentum is one of them, which was different than that kind of preliminary analysis would have led us to believe. Now, I think the key idea here is that characteristics contain a lot of useful, inf useful information about systematic exposure. So what if we reconfigure the observable factor models we've considered in two ways? One, Israel, Paul Harris, and Richardson, and Bai, Bali, and Wen constructed their factors to avoid market exposure. What if we had that back in you know, to our analysis? Is that going to help those models? Yes. Yes, it will. One. Two, what if we allow the exposures to those factors to be instrumented? Okay, when you don't have to estimate these factors, essentially what you're just estimating now is a big panel regression. It's a big panel regression where you estimate that, that gamma beta matrix is now coming from a pool panel regression of returns, excess returns on the interactions between characteristics and these factors that you're bringing in as data, you're treating as data. So we'll ask, 
does this instrumentation help? Okay, which again is bringing this kind of dimension reduction idea to the observable factor models. Now, instead of 14,000 or 56,000 different parameters, we're just estimating 200. We're letting the data on characteristics do most of the work. So in panel A, I show what happens by the, in these metrics when I use regression-based betas, okay? That's like 50,000 parameters. And in panel B, instead, we instrument the betas for these observable factor models. The Israel Paul Harris, Richardson, the Bai Bali and Wen, and also we'll bring over the FAM and French equity factors and use them too. And what you broadly see is that instrumenting the betas helps. You broadly see that it helps to explain overall risk in the total R squared metric, the expected returns, both conditionally, that's what the predictive R squared is telling you about, unconditionally, that's what the pricing error R squared is telling you about. And really importantly, big, I think the big bottom line here is that what now is being understood is a much more profitable mean variance efficient frontier. Okay. to the extent that's kind of the core of what we want to understand here, ever since Hansen and Richard, we're getting closer to it. In particular, we noticed that this Israel Paul Harrison Richardson model, when we augment it with a market factor, okay, so now it's a five factor model, and we instrument their betas. Now the conditional expected returns that are coming from that model are quite accurate. Now, spread portfolio based on those expected returns out of sample can give you a sharp ratio around three. Okay, not quite what we saw in IPCA, but getting really close. And indeed, the conditional expected returns coming from the Bai, Bali, and Wen model also have improved with the instrumented betas. So, broadly speaking, this idea of instrumenting betas with conditional uh, conditioning information, the characteristics, uh, seems very helpful from a model performance kind of perspective for trying to use that model to understand the systematic risk space. So the summary is just what I said. I'll note that what we have in the paper and are currently working on, I'd love to hear your ideas about. We have robustness uh, checks where instead of uh, using this like volatility, ex ante volatility adjusted uh, returns, we use just unadjusted returns, which is kind of the typical thing that uh, one does in equity analysis. We find that the performance is very similar across different kind of interesting bond market subsamples, high yield, investment grade, uh, liquidity, fallen angels, investment grade uh, names that fell to uh, high yield. It's robust to instituting a 10 day shift in the returns, which is tantamount to saying, hey, the investor needs two weeks to put on their trades instead of one trading week. It's robust to using quarterly returns. It's robust to a cross validation type exercise kind of alluded to earlier, where we'd estimate the factors and the parameters on one segment, say investment grade, and then take them over and try to use those without estimation to understand the high yield segment and vice versa. So there's some robustness to what I'm presenting as these benchmark results. And I just want to get kind of a picture in mind, don't have many pictures yet, this is going to be the one, for uh, how this model, even though it's a conditional model, so it's designed to explain conditional covariances. And then I will say like the bottom line here is that it's, it's designed to explain conditional covariances. And so it's not necessarily going to do well at explaining conditional expected returns. And the degree to which it does explain conditional expected returns well, which are those predictive R squareds being high, is the degree to which this asset pricing theory is holding that understanding aggregate covariance told us useful, maybe all the useful information about conditional expected returns. I think that that's the really neat thing that's going on here in our previous paper. It's another question then to answer if that translates into the unconditional expected returns that these different assets face. And turns out that this model does a, a pretty good job of explaining these unconditional expected returns as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna divide bonds into uh, six segments by rating. And the black bar shows just what's the average return over every bond in our sample that was AAA rated. Turns out it's negative. That's the negative excess return for those AAA bonds. 
For AA bonds, the black bar moves up roughly monotonically. So this is, these are statements about the, like the unconditional expected return for a bond in one of these rating buckets. What you see is that IPCA, the dark gray bar, is really the only model whose conditional expected returns translate directly into unconditional expected returns, just taking a time series average, that does a good job of explaining this pattern we see in the data. IPCA is the sole one that would tell you that triple A bonds have unconditional expected returns that are negative, like we actually see, and that rise monotonically. We see a less, uh, a poorer fit in understanding these unconditional expected returns coming from these competing models. For instance, the Israel Paul Harris or Richardson model, either as it was originally constructed with regression betas or when you instrument the betas, instrumenting the betas does help if you see these dark red bars kind of rising across. But the IPCA model seems to be really unique in terms of understanding unconditional expected returns as well as conditional expected returns, which we think is a contribution. My last part, when we estimate the unrestricted model, when we allow for a gamma beta, that's characteristics influencing betas, and a gamma alpha, that is characteristics directly telling us about returns, not about exposures. When we estimate that unrestricted model, we can use gamma alpha to define what we call a pure alpha portfolio. This is a portfolio that is orthogonal to the estimated aggregate risk space, to the betas. It's orthogonal to that by construction. In equities, the Kelly Pruitt Sue paper found that pure alpha portfolios are not nearly as profitable as systematic portfolios. That is not the case in bonds. I take that estimated gamma alpha. I use it to calculate what I call a pure alpha portfolio. Okay, so it's that, it's that regression vector, 47 parameters, intermediated through the characteristics for every bond, I hold that portfolio. Get an out of sample sharp ratio of 4.6. Okay, this pure alpha portfolio is just as profitable as what we saw in the systematic strategies as the tangency portfolio. But we found that statistically gamma alpha was insignificant. Okay, so this is a pointer to future research because on a statistical basis, the test we wrote down said the gamma alpha could be zero. But when I use that very same gamma alpha that I could accept is all zero and I use it, it defines a very profitable pure alpha strategy. So I think we need to pursue some more powerful tests within this framework. Interesting to me, equity momentum is an important characteristic here. Only part of its effect was systematic. We found that it was significantly affecting betas. It is significantly affecting these pure alpha profits. That contrasts with what Brian and Toby and I found in stocks, where equity momentum was telling you about stock returns in the future because only because it was telling you about exposures. Once you brought in that systematic information, momentum had no incremental information. Broadly speaking, this would be evidence against no arbitrage in, in bonds. Okay, so that statistical test that I reported before is in contrast to this result. And it'd be nice to think about reconciling that in the future. With that, I'm going to conclude. This is a conditional factor model um, that has a novel, impressive explanation of overall risk in the corporate bond market, the compensation that investors get for that risk, and therefore the mean variance sufficient frontier in that model. The instrumented beta idea that we use in that model can be used to enhance other factor models as well. We show that that's the case, and we find some mixed evidence for no arbitrage in the bond market. And for future directions, I hope uh, to hear some great ideas from Jenny and from all of you, so thank you very much. All right, thanks very much, Seth. That's uh, that's great. So let me turn it over to to Jenny. Jenny has, I think, the the best Zoom background I've ever seen. So she gets, she wins that prize. Now over to your discussion. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it's a really great paper. I really like it. Uh, I think this paper, like the many other presentations in the Sophie's seminar series. Uh, 
again and emphasize how advanced econometric methodology can deepen our understanding on the risk return analysis in asset pricing. And this is also point out some uh, future directions uh, for bond pricing, which I will review the entire literature and uh, pointing out where we are and where we are heading to. So SAS did a great job uh, presenting what they do. Basically, they propose a conditional factor pricing models. And here, the key important input is uh, they have a latent factor. So they're not as pre-specified uh, in different from my paper and many other existing literature. We kind of tend to already have idea what is important factor. So we pre-specify that, uh, but they don't. So this way you can always allow this time varying true factors uh, to capture what is in the return of the bond. Second feature about this one is they use a large set of bond characteristics. They actually have 29 bond characteristics. So this again, instrumented RF and beta also can help improve the performance. So not surprisingly, this novel risk return analysis with this IPCA model, they improve over the existing model by a large margin. And uh, to truly understand the paper's contribution, we have to go back to the corporate bond pricing literature. And before that, I want to first talk about a corporate bond. You know, there are so many papers now applying whatever exists studied in the equity market directly to corporate bond. By law of one price, that's true. The same asset equity and bonds issued by the same firm, they should both reflect the firm fundamentals. So those methodology in equity market should have potential apply to bond, but bond has some unique features. So bond is far more complicated than the equities. One example, one firm typically has one or two stocks, maybe different shares, but it can issue more than 1,000 corporate bonds. For example, I just checked this yesterday. By the end of the 2020, on that specific day, on average in the United States the corporations, they issue eight bonds per firm. And some, many of them issue only a few, but like the one issue 100, uh, sorry, 11,064 bonds is Goldman Sachs. So one firm can have many bonds and those bonds even you issued by same firm, which means they have should have the same cash flow in the future. They're gonna differ many dimensions. They are different in age, duration, size, maturity, Coupon rate is different. Coupon type is also different. Floating coupon and zero coupon, fixed coupon. They have a wholly different seniority. They have senior bond, junior bond, subordinated bond, and they have a bunch of option features like they are callable, they are pullable, they are convertible, exchangeable, fungible, and bonds also have so many covenants. So overall, bond is sophisticated with many unique features. But this is also one of the thing, I think this paper, why they have good performance, they, might, they emphasize this. There's a lot of information in those fixture bond characteristics and you need to take synthesize information from a large di dimension of these characteristics. Compared to equity, bonds also has a very important feature that is illiquidity. And this is, I actually I don't emphasize a little bit more, which is the omitted or not pay enough attention in this current paper. Lastly, bond payoff are kept. This is a fixed income, okay? Different from equity, it's a fixed income. So if a firm has a lot of good news, rarely has large impact on corporate bond. It might affect in stock prices that you, back and forth, but bond price is capped. It's usually around $1,000 or $5,000, depending on their face values. So, but they have tremendous thing, sensitivity on the downside. That's also my paper. We emphasize downside risk is very important for corporate bond things. And lastly, bond investors are different from equity investors. This is a two segmented market. They are dominated by institutional investors. While in the equity market, a lot of this retail investor play a role. There are 30, 40% of retail investors. That's why the lottery and many other features explained by behavior things play a role in the equity, but those fairly spare role in the bond market. Why I need to mention this unique thing about the corporate bond. 
because this is a unique feature important for the pricing of bond. Any paper directly apply equity methodology to bond is doable, but you are not respecting the unique feature. And that is the key. If you want to be a truly good pricing model in corporate bond, you have to consider taking into consideration about these unique features. And then let's just review the pricing about corporate bond. So traditionally, there's a bunch of scholars which are not typical asset pricers. They study structuring modeling. So they focus on the uh, credit credit spread structure model. They study the specifically default risk and the price credit yield spread. So there's long list of literature, Merton model, Black's Cox model, Leland model, all those fancy capital structure, cap, capital structure models. And recent advance is by like a Bolislav and Strabilev. They have something, they have stochastic volatility jump diffusion model. That is also econometric methodology uh, step in to help improve it. But what is the result of the structure modeling? No matter what you try, whatever complicated structure model you try, you always find those structure model priced credit spread is far away matching what in the real world. And so this has already become a credit yield spread puzzle. So because of that, uh, the scholars started developing a corresponding part is called a reduced form model. This by the name reduced form, they no longer, they kind of give up uh, those very com complex, uh, the stochastic volatility jump diffusion model. They start using a regression, similar like presented today, but it's different. It's Again, it's focused on credit yield spread. So whatever risk, in particular default risk or anything in the structure model, they try to find an empirical counterpart and put them into the regression. And because of its regression, you can keep adding on new risk factors, whatever they find. One of the most famous one is also my co-author Pierre and Robert and Christopher, the 2001 GF paper. But once again, this is confirming what is in the literature. This, there is still existing a credit yield spread puzzle. And that puzzle in particular is high for investment grade firms and for short duration firms, bonds. Okay, so this is, a, this is already in the past 20 years, a lot of this thing. So recent, um, uh, this, along this line, there's also some recent effort like Nozawa's JF paper and Zhiguo and his co-author, they try to bring in this institutional investors uh, unique features uh, and to see how inventory and those things play a role. But this is all following this line. There's a third one, okay. It's called factor modeling. This uh, actually pretty silent in the past literature. One of the representative is Gerbart 2005 JFE paper. It's only in the recent five or seven years becomes really popular, starting from Jostova's RFS paper. And that is focusing on how bond market momentum play a role in the cross section of corporate bond returns. And then there's, a, uh, including my paper, we, we JFE paper 2019, we kind of also respecting credit risk, liquidity, downside is important factors in the corporate bond market. So we kind of uh, inspired from the structure model, reduced form model, but then we apply this as a pricing methodology to show they do uh, priced in the cross section. But those kind of papers, they try to explain the return in sample, they not aim to do the out of sample things. So then it kicks in this paper and a one competing paper, which is uh, very similar, which is a uh, body, uh, Turan body and Amit Goyas 2020. It's not my paper, but it's uh, my cause. There's another paper, also 2020 paper. Go to this effect modeling. This time, uh, a lot of this uh, scholars in this direction is they apply the asset pricing methodology in this market. And I think this is a probably the future dimension. If you, is, there's very little can be improved in the structure modeling, reducible modeling. That's why that the literature is a little bit uh, quieted down. But if you really want to understand more about the price in corporate bond, probably factor modeling is direction in the futures. That's why the reason I like this paper.
And uh, this paper, as Seth already showed robustly, it has superior performance. This superiority is representative from their measures like uh, total R square, predictive R square, but overall it's out of sample predictions, which is the traditional literature in the bond studies don't pay attention at all. Okay, they focus on the in sample. This paper focus on the out of sample. And as I already mentioned, their superiority mainly coming from two dimension. One is dynamic. So they allow this bond return prediction with latent factors that always best describe the covariance among the returns. So it's time varying, it's changing, keep changing all the time. You can always allow the possibility, hey, it's not gonna be one factor always predicting this corporate bond return cross-sectionally. It's changing over time. You better allow some methodology to incorporate such dynamic pattern. Second, they try to respect there's a lot of bond characteristic and it's important to synthesize those information. Then you can better estimate time varying conditional betas. This superior performance compared to the current literature, including mine, is no doubt is superior because all the current literature is fixed factors and they are not instrumenting for a large set of bond characteristics. So this is a good thing about this paper. If anything I want to say about this paper, so since it's, it, 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 the, the main advantage of this paper is methodology. And then as, all, as a reader, I'm always cur curious the horse racing things. If you go, it's not explaining the true understanding, the true default risk, like those structural model, those already pre-specified. Your goal is to fall out of sample prediction. Then it's fair to compare with many other things. Indeed, two papers, including this competing paper, Turan Bali, Amit Goya, Huang Jiang, and Wen, they already using eight machine learning methodologies, including the PCA. And they have many others, since the audience is all econometric audience. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with those things, lasso, ridge regression, elastic net, free forward net neutral network, long short term neutral network. There's a long list of this uh, machine learning with big data. They're all sharing this two superior uh, performance resource like this paper. One, they allow this time varying thing, this dynamic modeling. Second, they do the dimension reduction for a large set of the characteristics. So Brian's another RFS paper with Gu and Xiu using those methodology, which I listed here, show that uh, they have, again, they have superior prediction out of sample power to predict the stock returns. They focus on out of sample. And this competing paper, let me instruct, just call it a BGHJW, they do the same thing. They actually inspired from this RFS paper. They also apply all this machine learning methodology. They also including the PCA. They probably not using the instrumented PCA, but they have other alternative PCA. So they test on bound characteristics on this out of sample. So if the paper can claim a significant marginal contribution, we would like to see horse race, how this is compared to other advanced methodologies. The second important thing, is to understanding the source of the predictability. So this paper, the authors show four out of 29 bond firm characteristics important, duration, spread, rating, and volatilities. That BGHJW, they study 43 bond characteristics and 93 stock characteristics. And among all of them, they show bond illiquidity, downside risk, and systematic risk matter most. So as audience, you're gonna feel clearly there's something there. The base of the information set will affect your final conclusions. If you based on this 29, which is not including any bound, well, not any direct bound liquidity measure, you will see liquidity is not important thing in those characteristics. But if you augment the base to including 43 bound and 93 star characteristics, your conclusion will be different. So this is actually an econometric question. I'm always curious for, for people in this kind of factor things. What is right base, right? A right base should take into consideration all the possible thing, but this list can keep going. Even for bound liquidity measure, you can find at least 10 bond liquidity measure, because in corporate bond market, no one reached to agreement which liquidity measure is best, never happens. 
So the space can be longer and longer. What about if I'm using even larger ones? Is there my conclusion going to be robust or going to be, again, is changing the things? And would this number of variables in the base affect the implication? And also, how to handle the imbalance? For example, let me just talk about this BGHJW. They have 43 bound, but they have at least four or five. It's all about illiquidity. What about its illiquidity is dominating in this characteristic? Do they have some imbalance about this base? So I think those are more econometric questions. Potentially, I hope the audience and someone can understand. Okay. And here, I want to emphasize two points. One, this spread, I'm always confused in this paper when I'm reading this spread, because in my mind, spread refers to the credit spread, which is uh, by convention in the structure modeling we understand. But credit spread by definition is directly related to bond returns. So it's probably not suitable as interpreting characteristics. They are in the parallel station. They both based on the bond price of crude interest. And then you calculate a bond return, you calculate the bond yield spread. Itself is largely examined in the literature as I show in the, as in the literature, both structure model, reduced form model, they study spread and only recently study return. You cannot using just the, the left hands explain right hands using yield spread to explain bond return. That is not a suitable characteristic. One thing I didn't mention here is bond illiquidity is really, really important based on my understanding this how this market. The reason you have this five-day conservative you also mentioned, it's illiquidity things. That's one of the things. So why bond is so illiquid? One reason is if you have 1,000 or even 100 or even just 10 bond, when people treat it, they can choose one of the A's, one of the tens. That is naturally going to dilute the liquidity about trading on this firm's bond. So illiquidity play an extremely important role for corporate bond pricing, which is not included in this paper's base information in those 29 bond characteristics. So I'm not surprising if you are using machine learning model with big data. I think they would definitely outperform the unconstrained linear regression model, such as OLS. They are guaranteed to have a good out of sample performance. But then you need to have this kind of a little bit more econometric understanding to do the horse racing. There are so many machine learning models, why this IPCA stand out things. And, uh, uh, if, and uh, again, it doesn't mean those traditional structure model reduced formula is useless. They try to tell stories. They try to understand why some default risk, how we can understand those capital structure affecting firms, the future cash flows. But if it's for the pure purpose of prediction, I think all the future studies should definitely consider advanced models such like the IPCA in this paper. But if you are looking at something else, to understanding the capital structure, default, cash flow, those things, you still need some of those structured models to help you guiding the, guiding the way of things. And any of those models, any of the paper in the corporate bond should not just directly apply the equity market. Another two paper, like the Torrent Chodia, Amit Goya's 2018 JFQA paper, and the Troy and Kim's 2019 JME paper, both mention one thing. All the popular predictors in the corporate bond, uh, sorry, in the equity market, those famous anomalies, they failed to explain anomalies in the corporate bond market. That is already pointing out to the market segmentation. Equity market is not readily can explain the characteristics in the, in the bond market. Also in that BMJW, they also check the stock market and bond market. What do they find is uh, if you're doing the machine learning with big data, bond characteristic definitely can predict bond return. And with those bond characteristics, those stock characteristics losing additional power. So this is a kind of in contrast to what is uh, today's presentation saying active momentum is important for bond pricing. Again, the base matters. If you're including a lot of the base, it might affect your result. And another thing uh, mentioned is uh, this, uh, there's a probably existing arbitrage in bonds. I still believe so, but there's also a reason why there is exist arbitrage. Then we need to go to this limits to arbitrage literature. Why? One of the key reasons is the transaction cost. 
there's tons of the paper on the illiquidity transaction cost in corporate bond market. If you want to claim, hey, I'm I'm doing a great job. My pure alpha has sharp ratio 4.6. This is a great investment strategy. So wait a second, how much you profit will be eroded by the transaction cost? That's another question you need to think about it before you can claim the success. So it's, it's a great paper. This is a direction we should all as asset pricing, not we should all, but if you purpose this prediction, you should head into this direction. But meanwhile, you do need to think about some unique feature in the corporate bond market and include those. That's easy to improve. You can just augment your base, but then it go back to my fundamental question. What is right base? How big is the base is suitable? So that is kind of a go back to the circle. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jenny. We ran a little over time, but um, there's so many good comments, I thought that would be fine. So maybe what we'll do is, Seth, if you'd like to respond, uh, we'll we'll take your response and then we'll do all the Q&A in the Hangout session afterwards. So yeah. take it away. Thank you, Jenny. That was great. I really appreciate that. Uh, and so I'll just make it quick. Um, so I think, like I mentioned in the presentation, I do think that we're not on the same game as that Bali paper, which you kindly pointed out and I looked up and I looked at what they are doing. That is pure prediction. Um, so at the end of the day, um, they are purely trying to predict returns and that's their object of interest. We are writing down a linear factor model where what we're trying to do is explain aggregate covariance with factors, with realized factors. So one of the ways that like mechanically would what would come out of that is that they could they could not present a total R squared. They have no factors that they've estimated. They they have no statement about does aggregate risk explain thus and such of bond returns, whereas we do, and so that leads to what I view as more kind of kind of surprise. Like what was the distance from like assumption to result? Surprise that we actually get expected returns that are a function of those covariances that are very accurate, and so I think that 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 distinguishes us from what the Bali paper is doing, or for that matter, what uh, Brian and, uh, and Da Cheng were doing in their RFS paper. That's also different. And that enables us to have an interpretation, I think at the end of the day, uh, of what these aggregate risks are. And ideally, you know, we could like link those to some kind of model of investor behavior or something like that, institutional investor behavior, as you point out very uh, important in this market. That, that's just one thing that came to mind about that Bali paper. Great point about like the base of characteristics. I think that it's, it, I like that that's where we're going right now in the literature because maybe we're moving on from like, well, does it beat the Fama French five factors to let's consider, have we included all the relevant information and can we add another piece and see if it's marginal contribution is significant. I like that, uh, you pointed that out and I, I agree that I, I would like the literature to go that way. I think we are. So I'll leave it at that and then we can have Q and A. Okay, well, thanks very much, Seth. And, and uh, to everyone in the audience, please stick around for another couple of minutes. We'll promote everyone to panelists and then we can have more questions, more discussion. But before we go, let me do a brief um, advertisement for the next Sophie seminar. The next Sophie seminar will be in two weeks time on um, March 22nd, the speaker will be Eric Geisels from the University of North Carolina, so just down the road from here in Durham. And his discussant is Max Farrell from the University of Chicago. So please join us uh, in a couple of weeks time on March 22.